Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Robert Borelli, formerly known as Robert Engel. He was a Gambino crime family associate. He was around a lot of major mob guys back in his era. Uh, Robert was also acquitted of a murder, but he ultimately did get in trouble. He went to prison, had a life-changing moment, and in that moment he decided he was going to cooperate with the feds and change his life. And since then he's been all about God and has a really good redemption story. So if you want to get more interviews like this, please hit subscribe. And without further ado, thank you for coming on, Robert. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm good, man. Well, that's uh, good. Yeah, uh, I want so to just let you know I really do appreciate you allowing me to share what God has done in my life. Yeah, and I appreciate you being able to come on and, you know, share your story. I mean. I totally agree. It's never too late for a new beginning. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how we'll start is we'll talk about your early life and, you know, what was it like before, you know, all the criminal activities or were you born into this necessarily? Well, you know, my family, you know, I, as a young kid, we've seen, like I had three types of people that I could identify with as a kid. One would be my parents, my family back home, you know, that I live with. And uh, we had struggles. We were poor and uh, we had struggles making ends meet at that point in time. Uh, we had four children, then another one came about eight years after me. I was the youngest one at that time. Actually, that other guy stole some of my uh, my high clout when he came around. But anyway, uh, so I seen that there. My family, the struggles would be having ends meet. You know, if there was an argument in the, in the house, sometimes it would be, you know, we don't have money for this, we don't have money for that. So at an early age, that's not kind of like, I didn't want to say like, you know, growing up, I want to become like my dad or something like that. Unfortunately, but that's just how I felt at that time. And then at that era too, we had people who were a little bit older than any of the guys from the neighbor coming back from the Vietnam War and they were kind of messed up with either drugs or, or alcohol and I didn't want to be like them. And then you had the stereotype guys that I seen were the mob guys. And I didn't know they were mob guys. They were just guys that hung out outside a social club, which is a storefront down the block from where I lived and they seemed to have it all together but the thing that attracted me the most was they seemed to get a lot of respect from everybody in the neighborhood my mom my dad people in the neighborhood officers there was a kind of mutual kind of respect with them and police officers you know at them days we had cops walking the beat in them days so there was kind of like that and I really gravitated to that and they were dressed nice and they had things that maybe I would have wanted later on in life and maybe a shortcut for me to get out of where I, you know, where my family was. So that's how I looked at it. So I didn't know at that point in time that it was, they gave me no crime family. So my neighborhood technically goes all the way back, maybe probably back into the twenties, 1920s of being uh, established with the gave me no crime family. They kind of ran the neighborhood. Uh, one of the movies that they made that was pretty popular back in, I think in the forties, fifties was Murder Incorporated. And that was about guys from my neighborhood and their relatives still lived in my neighborhood. So uh, that was kind of how I grew up. And that's, I was like one of those tough little, little kids, you know, feisty little kids. And uh, they liked the way I was and they allowed me to start hanging out with them doing like little errands. So that's how it really started with me. Yeah. And do you recall like your, your first interaction with them, you know, like where's, where did you introduce them or did they introduce yours to the, you, you know what I mean? How, how did, how was that? Well, you know, since they were right down the block and uh, like I said, I was a, a little tough kid, you know, I was smaller than everybody else. I didn't want people to pick on me, so I would act out in ways to make people not, not try to mess with me. And uh, the guys seen that and they kind of gravitated towards me, but they allowed me to start going into the club shooting pool and hanging out with them a little bit, running a little errand here and there for them. And, and that's basically how I started uh hanging out and, and uh, at a young age, I was probably maybe about, I'd say about maybe 12, 13 years old at that point in time. Yeah. And did they have you doing any other tasks besides that? Or when did those come? That came a little bit later, you know, um, the club that I, that was in my neighborhood moved all the way to, to Ozone Park in Queens. So there was another club on Eastern Parkway and there was a gentleman there, uh, who would allow me to work the card games and stuff like that. So, you know, like, I don't know if you ever seen the movie uh, Goodfellas or Sopranos, yeah. where they had the kid running around doing serving sandwiches and stuff. That was kind of like what I would do and make a couple of, they would tip me and stuff like that. 
and then, you know, run policies. If they asked me to go and pick up a policy slip, I didn't know what it was, but they said, go to this house and they'll give you a, a couple of dollars and, and wrap in, in paper and then bring it back. And that's kind of it. Then I did fireworks. I used to sell fireworks out of the trunk of uh, cars. So, What is a, a policy? I don't even know what that one is. Okay, it would be like, you, you know how we have um, the numbers today? You go into a store and play a number or yeah. you have OTB, mm -hmm. buffback betting. Well, oh. Before that came around, the bookmakers, it was called bookmaking. So it would be guys that took numbers and then guys that did took oh, uh, okay. bets or horse track bets from, from people who wanted to try to make a couple of dollars for themselves. Oh, like, yeah. The gambling thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just never heard that term. So yeah, that's different, but no, that's, that clears it up. <laughs> All right. But, uh, but yeah, so you, you started off, you know, kind of doing bookmaking and, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, when you kind of progressed older, you know, you led into some more serious things and, uh, what were some of those serious things? Well, you know, I, I end up meeting, um, uh, one of the, one of the bosses of my neighborhood, I end up meeting his son, Anthony Ruggiano. And his dad, we used to call, we didn't tell him to his face, but he was known as Fat Andy from the neighborhood. And he was one of the wise guys in the neighborhood. So I met up with his son, Anthony, and started hanging out with him in Queens in Ozone Park. And uh, what we used to do was go and hang out in bars. And we, you know, wanted to build a reputation, you know, being the tough guys in the neighborhood. And, you know, you hung out in bars, usually you're going to get into fight. And people came into the bars that we were hanging out with. And back in, when I was about 18 years old, uh, a fight started and somebody got killed and me and another guy were wanted for the murder. And his dad hid me out. His father hid me and my friend out for about a year and a half. When I came back in 1975 into the neighborhood, I was arrested for, it was, actually it was in February of 1975, I was arrested for two murders in possession of a weapon. Damn. So what ultimately, you know, happened with that? Because, I mean, you went on the run and then you came back, right? Well, uh, one of the cases I went to trial on and I, I got acquitted on the trial. The other one was dismissed. They didn't have enough evidence against me. So that's how the two murder cases went. The gun case, I took a plea of and then I, I uh, which will go put an appeal in again uh, on, the, on the plea that I took. And uh, I spent about two weeks in prison, maybe two and a half weeks in prison. And then I got dismissed on the appeal. So. Yeah. So you you came home and, you know, what did that look like? You know, what you what was everyone thinking of you? Well, because, you know, the street rules and of course the mob rules was, you know, if you get locked up, you keep your mouth shut. You know, you don't you don't say nothing. You don't talk to the cops. You don't talk to anybody. And I kind of follow those rules to, uh, at that time. And uh, so when I did get bailed out before I went to trial on these cases, when I got when they, these guys ended up bailing me out and uh, they would parade me around as the up and coming star and they gave me no crime family. So uh, the only problem I had was my dad was German. So I had a German na last name. And at that time, uh, they weren't straightening out anybody unless you had an Italian father. So I couldn't get into that position, but I tried to do whatever I can to kind of, if you've seen the movie Goodfellas, you have Jimmy Burke there. That was his real name in life. And Robert De Niro portrays him. And I forget, I think they call him Jimmy, Jimmy Conway. Well, he was Irish and he couldn't get strained out, but yet he had the reputation and, and, and all that there of being a, you know, a powerful guy. And that's kind of like, I wanted to be like that, you know, since I couldn't get strained out myself. So. It was about building a reputation for me. Basically, that's what I did. Yeah, and you know, since you couldn't be made, I mean, was did you feel a certain way about that, or did you? I mean, how did that make you feel that you couldn't be made in this organization? Yeah, because you know, part of the rule is if a made man, a guy like me wouldn't be able to. If a made guy came over to me and it was kind of an argument or something like that, I would have to back off because he was made and I wasn't. And the only way it could get straightened out, and there was a couple of times when I got in trouble with made guys, and my guy, who was Nicky Carrazzo at that time, um, got straightened out, and then he would speak on my behalf. I couldn't speak to these these guys or have a sit down with them, is what they so called it. So uh, Nicky was my rescue guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you did have another way to still get your point across, or you know, get your message out there. Well, I was one of those guys that, you know, they kind of called me like a loose cannon, you know. Uh, I didn't take it, anybody's nonsense, you know. People, 
uh, you know, I defended myself no matter what. And if people disrespected me, I let them know that they disrespected me. So if they were a wise guy, they weren't a wise guy. And I got myself into a lot of trouble that way because of my attitude towards them. And then Mickey would be the guy that would have to sit down with them and bail and bail my, me out. Otherwise, I could, you know, wind up in a lot of trouble. Or, yeah. maybe, or maybe even in a trunk. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just kind of the things that come with the life, you know? <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah, and, um, you know, what? Uh, when you were at your, kind of like your highest point, you know, doing stuff with the Gambino crime family, what did a day in the life look like for you? Well, me, I was paraded around and brought to Manhattan, uh, O'Neill De La Rosa's club where O'Neill hung out. He was the underboss. And, you know, that's where all the mob, really big mob guys kind of kind of hung out and stuff. So we would, my guys opened up a, a dice game, which is illegal crap. We call them crap games. And I would work those crap games, make a couple of dollars, you know, take numbers at those games, make a couple of dollars that way. Uh, if a score came, when, when I mean a score, any kind of a robbery, whether it was an armed robbery or something where I can make extra money with, I would do that there also. So I had the reputation, I said, of, uh, First of all, I had a reputation. I don't like to talk a lot about who I was, but I did have a reputation of that not too many people would mess with me in the neighborhood. Everybody kind of like, you know, Norm from Cheers. Everybody knew my name, you know? Yeah. No, that makes sense, man. Um, who was the acting boss, you know, for you? The acting boss for the Gambino Crime Family at that time was Paul Castellano. The underboss was O'Neill De La Grosse. And my guy that I was around was just a, a, a made guy, a soldier. Oh, okay. And were, were you pretty close with all them then, Paul Castellano? And... Well, not Paulie so much. Because Paulie was all the way all, all, all in a different area of Brooklyn. But in Manhattan, I got pretty close with uh, O'Neill De La Grosse because I would be in his club and they would introduce me to him, hang out. And I couldn't tell you that I got really, really close with him. But he knew of me and I knew, definitely knew, knew of him. So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what is, you know, kind of the speculation with, you know, the mob not getting involved with drugs? Because, I mean, you know, with you, were you uh, selling it at any point? Yeah, you know, I seen that there was a lot of big money around in that business because I seen there, there was guys. What, what, what I was taught when I was younger that you didn't mess with drugs and the mob didn't mess with drugs, you know. Mm -hmm. and that might have been right with the family that I was involved in, the Gambinos. But when I started hanging out in Manhattan, I seen a lot of the guys messing with drugs. I mean, there was big money around it. So I got involved with that and uh, I got involved. And I figured that's my next step. Because, you know, if you make a lot of money and you have a lot of friends and you have a lot of friends, you make yourself be a little bit more powerful if you have a lot of people around you. So that was kind of, you know, the mold that I kind of was trying to get into. But unfortunately for me, um, you know, I was doing the drugs and then they eventually what happened is later on after quite a few years the drugs started doing me yeah and how did that you know progress how did that happen for you you know was it just a little here and there and then boom or it started very social you know you go out and you hang out in a bar you know discos was big back in the 70s and early 80s so i'd be in every kind of disco you could possibly name you know uh, always a different one every other night i had a special one that i would go to and cocaine was part of the deal, you drink, you know, the kind of like the concept was instead of getting drunk and acting like a fool, you do a little bit of cocaine, you could drink a little bit more. And that's kind of how, how it was for me. But then I seen that I was getting more addicted to the cocaine and drinking a little bit less. And then that's when freebasing came around and somebody introduced me to freebasing and freebasing kind of made me more calmer. I wasn't that addicted to it so it kind of took me away from the cocaine or even though it is cocaine cooked but it kind of like the addiction wasn't as strong with it as it was when i was snorting cocaine so i got involved with that and um that worked for about 10 years and eventually i started losing everything uh my reputation people being around me making money and uh crack cocaine came around and i succumbed to crack cocaine probably when i was about maybe i say 30 something years old. Yeah. So <clears throat> how long, uh, you know, did it take for you to kind of start losing your reputation? You know, was it, you know, five years after or, you know, could, did people start seeing you slip that you can remember or recall? Well, the thing with me is I would run away. So if nobody could find me for a couple of, like a week or two, 
They kind of said, okay, he's probably on a, we just call it a binge. So I would go on binges for weeks and I would hide myself into a hotel or something like that there, you know. But when I started not earning any more money and using whatever money, money that I did have stored up, uh, that's when things started getting really bad. And before you know it, I was out in the streets just trying to hustle to get high. Yeah. And, you know, did people, you know, eventually start, you know, kind of pulling away from you thinking like, you know, let's not do business with him no, and uh, no more? Well, that was it because what happened is, is that I was just wasn't trustworthy anymore in a lot of areas. You know, uh, part of the mob thing is, you know, if you're addicted to anything, whether it was alcohol or anything, you, you didn't have a lot of control of yourself. So there might have been a little bit distrust in the beginning. But then when they seen that I was really getting bad on it, it was a lot. So, yeah, a lot of people pulled away from me because here I was, the up-and-coming star, you know, gave me no crime family, and now I'm known that, you know, people are hearing my name is Robert the Crackhead. So uh, that that's kind of where I went. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, people just pulled away from me. And the recommendation was try to get it cleaned up. And every time I got cleaned up, I'd go back around the guys. And then before you know, I was back getting high again. So it was just uh, kind of an ongoing uh, uh, path for me. Um, you know, I stayed clean for about a year and then hang out with the guys again, get my, you know, they allowed me to come back in and do some things for them. And then before you know it, I got things back. And then before you know it, I was losing it all again to succumb to the addiction. Did um, any of them help you with like any treatment or anything that you'd go to? Oh yeah, a lot of them, you know, we had a lot of uh, connections and treatment centers and, and a lot of them were good, good, you know, I went to and uh, helped me out somewhat. You know, for me, it just didn't work. Uh, I believe that I ha had, and might even still have a little bit of an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Because no matter what it was, it wasn't just drugs, it was gambling. No matter what I did, I did it to the extreme. So in the beginning, it was really gambling. I was a bad gambler. I'd be at the racetrack every day, you know, spending my money and everybody else's money and then trying to make up for it and stuff like that. And then drinking, of course, that was part of it. And then that's when the cocaine came in and I would say that's what brought me to my knees was crack cocaine brought me to my knees. And when you were losing all this money and stuff, did these guys, you know, like that you're around, start getting mad, like the mob guys and, you know, wanting to get rid of you or, you know, whack you or anything that you recall? I'm sure that there was. I know there's a couple of times that people were waiting for me by my house uh, that I had maybe uh, an altercation with. Uh, and uh, I didn't go home that night only by... I could see now by the grace of God, but I just didn't go home that night. And then people found out that people were looking for me. That's when Nikki would come in and say, don't go home. Uh, let me strain it out before you go you, you, you go back to your house. And that's how it worked out for me. But there's one episode that I was working in the crap game uh, and um, in Manhattan. And of course, all these big shots, their money is in the bankroll. And the guy that was running it had to leave early. So he told me, to get the bankroll and bring it home and then bring it back the next day. And it was about maybe ten or eleven thousand dollars. And I went to the racetrack early that day and then you know, I'll gamble a little bit, you know, out of my own money, and then I'll bring the money to the crap game, you know. Didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I gambled almost all of that money away. So that was the first time uh there was some distrust there. Um it wasn't drug related, but it was gambling. I gambled all that, all that money and I didn't have a way of bringing it back. So I just never showed up again. And then eventually Nikki and them caught up with me probably about maybe a couple of weeks later, gave me a little bit of a beating. And then I, you know, there's a way I had to pay back the money, but they, they made good for me because that would have been a dead sentence. You know? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the money and all that, you know, they probably don't take that lightly at all. Yeah. Yeah, well, they have to set the example anyway. If one person doesn't get away with it, so Nikki, what Nikki did was he made up. He didn't tell them I gambled the money. He told them I got locked up, and they couldn't find the money, and they brought the money to there. So, I mean, you talk about captains and bosses uh, of people's money, which they would have tolerated. Something bad would have happened to me, but Nikki uh, rescued me on that one. Yeah, no, it sounds like he always looked out for you. Yeah, me and him were very close. I was kind of like the son that he always wanted. He had two daughters. 
Oh, dang. So what did he ultimately pass away in this life or was he able to? No, he, you know, he's still alive. He's still around. Uh, I, I think part of the, the disgrace or me getting high and being out in the streets was a reflection on him because he used to be the one that paraded me around to everybody. And now all of a sudden, everybody's hand went up to that case. Heard he was all strung out on crack. So I guess I was an embarrassment. So he had a, I still believe that he loved me, but he had to break ties with me. He couldn't be seen with me because it would hurt his reputation. Yeah, no, I, I know that's uh, addiction is definitely a hard thing, you know, especially when you're the new person going through it. I mean, it, 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 both ways. I mean, for the person that's trying to help you out, you know, it's just constant battle. You know what I mean? Well, it, it is, you know, uh, you know what I say about addiction and, and I know from my own experience, it'll, it'll make you do things you never thought you would do. Take you places you never wanted to go and keep you a lot longer than you wanted to stay. Yeah. No, that's true, man. And it, it ultimately uh, didn't it lead you into prison? Well, I've been in and out of prison a lot before that there for, mm -hmm. for a couple of years here and there. Uh, this would have been my fourth conviction, which I was registered as a career criminal. And uh, I got locked up and uh, I called a visit by two angels is how I describe them. Not they weren't angels, but they were warrant officers. I was had a case pending in Queens for selling drugs. The FBI was looking for me for a case that all the guys that, you know, Nikki and them that I mentioned, a case in Miami, Florida, for a RICO Act. And um, when I found out that I was wanted for the RICO Act by the feds, I didn't show up for the state case because I knew they would nail me there. So I was on the land from both of those cases, running away from the law. And uh, these warrant officers finally found me. I call them my angels because it's the last time. It was actually January 23rd, 1997. And um, that's the last time I had a drink and a drug. And then I got incarcerated to Rikers Island. And then that's when the, the God story starts unfolding in my life. Yeah. And when you ended up there, what, what happened? You know, what made you, you know, there was this moment that you had uh, that really changed your life. Well, in, in 1993, uh, my girlfriend uh, gave birth to my daughter and uh you know, I thought, okay, I need to straighten myself out. I have someone I need to take care of. I was seven weeks into we, she was home. I, my little girl, Brianna, was home. I had an argument with her mother, went out to get high one more time. And you know the old saying, one is too many, a thousand is not enough. Well, for me, one was too many and a hundred thousand was not enough. I stood out in the streets, never came back home. Uh, so when I did get locked up in 97, you know, I'm thinking, okay, uh, I, of course, I don't have any money. I was strung out on crack cocaine. Uh, I know I'm not going to get a bailed out. So I try to do what I always do is make myself as comfortable as I possibly can while I'm going to serve my time. <clears throat> and I'm calling up people trying to get money for a good attorney to get me out of the mess that I got myself into. But at the same token, I'm trying to get commissary money so I could live as comfortable as possible. Commissary is a store that you can go to when you're in jail for cigarettes, coffee, and stuff like that. So I'm calling up a lot of people. A lot of people are just brushing me off. You know, nobody wants to help. In other words, the sad part was most people thought that I was better off in jail than out in the streets because of what I was doing to myself. Kind of a really uh, <sighs> hopeless kind of situation is what I felt. So one girl I called up was a good friend of mine. She said, why don't you go read the Bible? And I'm telling you, know, that's a brush off. But the thing is that my daughter's mother's allowing me to talk to my daughter. My daughter's about three and a half years old at this time. And my daughter's mother's allowing me to talk to my daughter over the phone. So I'm talking to her one time and she's crying. And I, I said, Brianna, why are you crying? And she said, because you won't come and see me. And I have to tell you, if I could have went and got high at that time, I would have. But the pain of walking out on my little girl, the reality of what I did, uh, the reality of not even wanting to go see her because I'd rather get high than go see my own little girl. I mean, that pain was so great in my life that I just I just started crying like a little baby. So I slammed down the phone and I want the inmates to see me crying and I ran back to my cell. And I'll say this here, I was raised Roman Catholic, so I knew about God. I don't say I, I don't say I knew God, but I knew about God. And I kind of gave God an ultimatum at that point in time. And through my tears, I said, God, if you're real, either have somebody kill me or change me. I don't want to live with this pain anymore. I just didn't want to live anymore. And um, I believe God answered the sincerity of my cry that I really didn't want to live this life anymore. 
And that's when uh, I believe he came into my life and changed it. Yeah, man, that's that's crazy. You know, that's just, you know, such a, you know, you know, when you're saying this to me, it's just such a so sad story. You know, I mean, you can just feel the pain and stuff. But, you know, I mean, addiction is just such a crazy thing, how it can, you know, take over you just slowly. And then eventually you're like, oh, oh you know, you don't realize how much time is gone. And then, I mean, in your situation, you're in prison and then, you know, your daughter's asking for you and stuff. I mean, you know, I got a little girl, too. So, I mean, it just that would hurt a lot, man. So I, I completely understand, like, that would be horrible, you know, to hear that. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm glad that you changed your life and you're able to be done with, you know, the drinking and, uh, you know, the drugs and everything like that, man. You know, I look back at my life now and I think God was trying to get my attention for the longest time. I've been in and out of prisons, always in trouble. I think he was just trying to get my attention. And for a long time, I ignored him. And I think the one time that I really was asking for his help because... Listen, I felt completely helpless and hopeless at that point in time. Uh, and I think that he said, okay, now you're ready. So he came into my life. And, and ever since then, it's been changed. And, and hey, look, man, I, <laughs> I just love who I am today. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's completely different. You know, when you were in prison, I mean, what, uh, I mean, so you, you, uh, you know, went to God and basically you started, you know, what did you do? I mean, how long were you in prison? Well, I, you know, what happened was is <clears throat> at the same time the governor's government's bothering my mom over in florida and when i call up my mom and she's telling me about this agent that keeps hassling her and stuff and i just said mom what did he leave a car she said yeah i said give me his phone number and my mom wasn't happy well she said what are you gonna do and i said mom don't worry about it and um and because I really felt hopeless, and listen, I, I felt at that point in time, I didn't understand me crying out to God what was going to happen. I really didn't understand any of that, to be honest with you. But I just felt that I was Robert the Crackhead. I'm probably going to die Robert the Crackhead because no matter how many times I cleaned up myself, no matter how many times I was in and out of prison, I kept falling prey to either the mob, that lifestyle, criminal lifestyle, and back out on drugs again. So I didn't see any hope for me whatsoever. And I figured the government could help me. So when I called up the FBI agent, he said, well, I believe in a sense, and we'll use a little mob term. He gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. Uh, he said, if you cooperate with us, uh, we'll recommend you into the witness protection program and you can start a new life all over again. And that sounded like the best idea I could ever come, up, come across. The best option I think I had. I was never going to be able, no matter how many, clean, even if I cleaned up my life, I was never going to be the mobster that I wanted to be because that, that drugs ruined that reputation already. I might have been able to be around it, but I never would have been the guy that I wanted to be in the mob. I want to gain that all that respect again. And then being out and out of prison and always coming to, 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 to drugs, I didn't see any hope for me. So I, I took that, I, I took that uh, invitation, um, accepted it. And uh, from there, that's when everything started changing. So. You know, you would think, okay, I got God on my side, I got the FBI on my side, and prison time would be a lot of, a little bit easier, and it didn't work out that way for me. I was locked up for 24, 23 hours a day. Uh, the government came, took me out of Rikers Island, and brought me to Miami Dade County Jail. Um, but I have to tell you, you know, the Bible says in, in Psalm 37, 4, it says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And what I mean by that for me was my delight was to get to know Jesus Christ more and more and more. I mean, when he came into my life, I just had a hunger and a thirst for more of him. I mean, every book I used to read, I gave away and I would just read the Bible. I wouldn't read nothing in newspapers, nothing else, just the Bible. And I believe because my delight was in knowing him more, he gave me the desires of my heart was to get to know him more. And every place I went from that point in time was either more or Christianity, the Bible studies, being baptized all over again. I mean, God was just moving. His spirit was moving, taking me places where I get to know him more and more. Yeah. I mean, you had plenty of time to do it, you know, the circumstances, you know, I mean, you had, it. you, you know, you, you cooperated, right. You know, so what was, uh, you know, what, what kind of was that? Do you have to testify and stuff on people? Well, I, I was supposed to testify in a case that everybody ended up taking a plea on. On one case, I did testify, a Miami case, an old case. Uh, that was happening when I was back in, in the mob in 1995, I believe it was. 
Um, so I'm one of those cases I had to testify against. But, you know, I was brought in a lot of times to cooperate on certain cases that were going on. And, um, you know, uh, this is after I'm released from prison. Um, and, and, you know, I, I felt as a Christian man, uh, I made a commitment with the government uh, and I was going to keep my commitment with the government. I wanted to, to make sure that I was being right with them the same way they were being right with me. And my integrity was very important as a Christian. But every time they would bring me in, you know, I would say to the AU, the US, to AUS attorney, the assistant US attorney, I would say, if you could do this case without me, I appreciate you do it without me. And almost every time, matter of fact, just about every time except one time that they didn't use me. Really? Yeah. I, mean, I can't, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's something else. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think they respected me and they respected, you know, who I was at that point in time. And I definitely want to give them the respect also. And once again, like I said, keep my commitment. I, I made a commitment to them. I want them to keep it. And uh, it just worked out great. I mean, some of them, some of these FBI agents, I'm still good friends with. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, now you wrote a book. And uh, when you got out of prison, you wrote this or did you write it while you were in prison? No, the book came a lot later. Now I just want to clear up the story. I did not write the book. I I, I would have a hard time writing my name. <laughs> <laughs> I have an eighth grade education, and only through the grace of God was I able. After I got out of prison, to to get uh, an associate's degree in biblical studies, but I'm not uh, a good good at that stuff. So uh, H. Scott Hunt, it would be Robert Borelli. H. Scott Hunt as the author. I was the co-author of the book. H. Scott Hunt wrote the book. Um, it's called The Witness. I was a witness for the government. Now I'm a witness for Christ. And basically the story is just about bringing hope into maybe people who, are like me, succumb to drugs, criminal life. You know, like I say, no matter where you're at, whatever you're going through, Christian, non-Christian, it's never too late for a new beginning. Struggles come, but we can always start all over again. We don't have to stay stuck where we're at. And that's kind of why we wrote the book. But also the part of the book for me personally was to write it for the guys back home to see who what I who I am today and the people who I'm around today can't believe I'm that guy back home so it was kind of like a way of disclosing everything for everybody to see and you know my, my theme is it's never too late for a new beginning uh, I truly believe that God can change anyone's life God rescued redeemed and restored me back to himself and I'm thankful for that every day so the book was was written on on that, those basis, and somebody else wrote the book. It's my story. It took three and a half years to write. A lot of prayer into the book before we even put it out there. It's self-published, so it's not really known really well. So how I do it is through interviews. People could go to my website and make a donation. I send them a book. I'll sign it for them if they want it signed. Or they could go to Amazon.com and buy it off of there. I think it's $15 there, a book. Um, but it's a way of getting the book out there also letting people know that there is a book and just tells you about a lot of things that we spoke about, but going into maybe a little bit more detail than we did. Yeah. And, um, you know, so if you guys want to get a, a copy of his book, you know, I'll put a link in the description below and you can guys go get one. Is there any uh, place else people can find you or do you do any other social media or just, you know, the book that you got? Out? We're working on, on some stuff now. You know, like I said, I'm not really good. There's a whole new, new, new life for me, even though I've been saved over 25 years. But with media and stuff like that, I'm, I'm not media suave in any shape. So we're trying to get people more on our team of the ministry that we do. So not only do I do a lot of interview, interviews, but I do a lot of speaking at uh, recovery groups, addiction groups, churches, you know, men's events, women's events. I just recently went to Oklahoma and did a, a camp with the youth. And I'm telling you, I was very nervous because usually I share my testimony, but when you're at a camp for like five days, you can't just keep sharing your testimony. So I, I didn't know how to respond, but it was, it was just, the greatest, greatest, one of the greatest times of my life was being able to talk to these young kids. And, you know, my message to them is you don't have to go through what I went through to get to where I am today, man. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, and he will change your life. 
Yeah. I mean, who else better to hear from than someone that's actually went through it, you know, and that, that you really make an impact on them, I'm sure, man. And, you know, you can save a lot of people, you know, by doing what you do. I mean, you're definitely someone that has really changed their life around and it stays true to it. I mean, you still go to all these uh, all these church events, you do the speaking events and, you know, and even through this interview, I mean, you can tell, I mean, you're still all about, you know, God. I mean, look at behind you, you got the, the cross on the wall and stuff, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I love what I, you know, I love what I do because I, I do what I love. And True. I love to talk to about Jesus. I'm more interested in people's souls than I am, and, and might sound harsh, but I'm, I'm more interested in, in people's eternity than I am about their life here right now. Yeah, I mean. I, I spend with eternity with as many people as I possibly can. Yeah, you just got to get them there. <laughs> I can't, but I can introduce them to the one that can. Yeah. His name is Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on, Robert. Did you want to add anything else before we wrap up? You no, know, I just appreciate if anybody's interested, you know, the, the, the website's robertborelli.com. Uh, you can make a donation and we'll just put the information about where you want me to mail it to, if you want it signed, and who to address the book to. And I, I mail them out personally myself. So you'll get the book. Sometimes it takes about a week or two with the mail today. So, but that'd be the best way to get the book. And I appreciate it because the book, whatever money that's that's donated to the book, it goes into the ministry. I don't take personal money out of it. It's just yeah. a way of keeping us going and doing interviews and speaking about Jesus. So. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. So yeah, I didn't even know I, that you did that too. I mean, that's that's see, that's another good thing. But you know, I, I do appreciate you coming on, man, and sharing your story. I mean, this is has definitely been good with you, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Just to let the people know, I am a 501c3. So that means any donation, you can use it for uh, a write-off on your taxes. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, some people like to do that too. I know where it's going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, why it's, and what it's being used for. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for this time. I hope we get to talk again. So let's not be strangers. Well, what'd you guys think? Robert got a really interesting story. He lived the mafia life and he ended up becoming an informant. You know, not a lot of people come out of hiding and start talking, you know, so he was definitely an exclusive guest. So I hope you guys enjoyed him. He's also going to be in the American Mafia documentary I've been working on. So please hit subscribe if you want to be the first to get that when it comes out. Also, if you want to support me, I got t-shirts and hoodies on my website. So I'll put a link in the description for that. And lastly, I'll put a playlist of all my other Mafia interviews that I've done. So I think you'll enjoy them. Please check them out. Thanks again for watching.